G'day, everyone. Howdy. Hello. I, there's too many faces on the screens at the moment, so I can't say hello to everyone individually, but um, I can see Sarah and uh, Emma from the LHD and Glenn, and hello, everyone. Um, we've got our, our, our chairman, Christopher Brown, will be joining us shortly, but um, basically the, the, you know, the, the main thing today we want to get through is um, um, Alison Morgan, who's kindly um, offered up some time from um, DPC, who's running this, this program on, on behalf of um, DPC, um, to talk through um, sort of the information that's been shared publicly um, over the past few weeks and um, going back to, to last year when the announcement was first made, um, what it all means, what it's about, um, and talk through the process that's going to be playing out over the, over the coming months. So, um, Alison's going to run through a presentation very shortly, um, but before we get to that, um, Christopher Brown's going to provide a bit of context to, to the Western Invest Fund and, and our involvement um, that we've had with, with, with Premiers and, and various others um, over the course of 2021 and 2022. Um, after Alison's um, presented, um, you know the work that they're they're up to at the moment. Um, there'll be an opportunity for for Q and A, and we'll be leading some of that. If there are any questions while Alison's um, presenting, can I just ask either put them through the the, the chat format, um, and we can get to them once we've we've gone through that. Um, Alison's finished, um, or just put your hand up throughout um, after we reach the second half of the session, and we'll, we'll try to get to everyone. Um, our, our hope is that if we don't get to everyone, I know it's, it's a fairly big room, so we may not get to everyone today, but if you do want to put something in writing um, via the chat function, um, we'll be sure um, if Alison and the team are comfortable with, with sharing that with you guys. Is that okay, Alison? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we welcome any inquiries. So, Perfect. I might go to, I'll throw to Christopher now to give a bit of an introduction and then um, hand over to Alison. See you, Thanks, Alison. Appreciate it. And thanks to everybody uh, for making time this morning, particularly those who are backing up from last night's event, uh, where I thought Stuart Ayres would provide a lot of context. He gave a great speech at our partnership dinner, but actually didn't mention West Invest Fund at all. So uh, filling in a few gaps. I'm loath to give too much context because the woman running the show is about to follow me. So let me give very high level background. Um, in the dark days of COVID lockdown, the harsh lockdown across Western Sydney, uh, we were dealing, frankly, to be honest, we were having trouble dealing with the Premier on it because for all of Gladys's greatness, my friendship with her, I just couldn't get her to crack the fact there is a latte line, there was a disadvantage inherent in the in the lockdown, there is a need for a major social economic transformation. Um, and frankly, we had a bit of frustration engaged very closely with the then Treasurer Dominic Perrette, his Chief of Staff, Brand Black, who had since ascended to Premier greatness um, and spoke about the need to build back better, as I said last night, that you know, to almost avoid, or not to talk about a lot of people going through the immediate stimulus. How do we immediately get out of this? And our view was, of course, that will happen. We wanted to look over the horizon for long-term social and economic transformation, the yeah. chance to reset Western Sydney in this process. So working with them, I had hoped for a one or two billion dollar kind of overall package. I think somebody, maybe Stuart, came up with a genius idea of why don't we use the proceeds from the sale of WestConnex, which was happening as a bit of cover, and suddenly it's a five billion dollar fund, and uh, that, that that's fantastic. Um, so the from that it would take a bit by surprise, and um, and but surprise can be a good thing. Um, it very much came out as context with that to be a an amenity fund, and some people dismiss that as amenity. As I'd say openly, in Western Sydney, amenity is a productivity issue. And we're fighting in a, in a competitive battle for the human talent, for global capital, um, and against inherent prejudice. Amenity does really matter more in Western Sydney than elsewhere. Amenity can mean, and you know, you know I've seen the SEP today, you know, um, shade, good coffee, safe streets, well lit, all, all manner of things. It's not, it's not just a nice bit of addition. It, for us, it's fundamental to attract investment, retain and secure talent. So uh, we have maintained that focus with that. We accept that this is a project fund, not a program fund. It's not about long-term, well-meaning, very worthwhile social transformation change programs. It's about building the infrastructure and probably more minor. I accept it's not major hospitals. It's not major transport. It's, it's projects about 
three fifths are going to, st to state government agencies to do non business as usual things to bring forward projects from a bottom drawer of the secretary just about Western Sydney that might not normally get through the budget process. And about two fifths are going to contestable projects, including direct grants to councils. And what we're probably talking about today, about a 1.8 billion, I think, of money that can be put up um, to, to be done to go towards those areas in the identified LGAs. It's for the first time the government's actually defined Western Sydney. So it's included unusually, I'm coupled with a Burwood and Stratfield, but then otherwise it's the usual suspects and Hawkesbury to Wallandilly, or stops in between, Bank Canary Banks down and Parramatta is sort of the eastern fringe. Um, so that's allowed those elements to come in. I think there's, and we're certainly campaigning for a couple of things ongoing. Um, a preference for the areas that really affected by lockdown. Everybody's in Western Sydney, but this is effectively a social transformation, economic transformation fund, particularly for the other side of the latte line. And we'll maintain that, that which completely, not to exclude the hills, or whatever, but we, we want to see a maximisation in areas that really need it. Secondly, we pushed for a role for the private sector to be involved. And I think there's an acceptance that when combined in a bid led by a public sector agency, a local government or some site, and it's not for private profit um, that things like clubs and shopping centres and others, big players in our that, who are too often the two most significant private sector players in most of our town centres. So to exclude would be tough where they can contribute to a well-meaning effort by a council or another entity to to produce things or impact the local community. I think that's being broadly accepted. And lastly, we're we're very much maintaining a direction and push that this shouldn't be just an election fund. Yes, we accept the money we allocated before the next election, um, but I think everybody's watching from, from all of the generals to internal treasury and, and those and others. I think there's a genuine commitment that this is post the Premier's declaration that the days of whiteboard schemes on all sides of politics are gone. This one has to matter. We have pushed for projects of scale, scale in size for scale and significance. And lastly, Credit Allison and Sarah Cruikshank and others at DPC and at Treasury. We've been working closely on, including with some of our partners input, how do you, so they say we accept that, we accept projects of great transformation. How do you bring forward that that criteria, the, the judging criteria on applications that they will be in the long-term projects of great significance? And I don't envy Alison and her team to do that. We didn't have a perfect solution, but uh, we do admire the fact that that's the thinking that, that starts out. So in, in closing, we want to encourage all of our partners, be they in local government, in NGOs, in the private sector to think big, but think quickly. We don't have months and months to ponder and, and naval gaze on this, it's it's to get cracking. And I fact the DPC is being willing to help us process that to get applications in, to try and guide them so they're not wasting all of your time on things that aren't gonna get through. Uh, we're offering effectively a marriage broker service. If a council wants to talk to a private sector, wants to talk to an NGO, yell out where we can help. We don't intend to do five page submissions of everybody's application, but we will, we are very much, uh, we don't intend to apply on our own. We're here to try and facilitate people to make this work and to help Alison and her team at DPC make sure the money goes where we really can change the lives in the long term for people that COVID demonstrated to be on the wrong side, the wrong impact of a latte line, better economic uh, opportunity, better social inclusion. Uh, by a, a more amenable and livable Western Sydney, more attractive to investment, more sustainable in its delivery. So quick backdrop from us. And uh, with that, Alison, thank you for your time. Um, to We've encouraged everybody to, we've asked everybody to stay silent, let you go for it, and then we'll have a bit of a, and we'll run a bit of a Q&A. I don't think you'll approve applications during the session, but hopefully by virtue of the information provided, uh, we just want to stimulate thinking and imagine a quick imagination in the region and anything we can do beyond this to help that we're here to, here to help in that way. So over to you, Adam, Alison, all yours. All yours, Alison. Thank you, Adam. And Christopher, thank you all. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I would like to start today by acknowledging that we are on various traditional lands across the state. Um, and I'd like to pay our respects to elders past, present, and commit our support to emerging leaders of the future. In the room here with me, I have uh, Joe Vaughan, um, who is our Director of Communications and Engagement. And I have Mark Kay with me, who's my Director for the Grants Program. So I've got the Brains Trust so we can answer any of those technical questions that we get. 
I will run through a quick presentation. Christopher's given us a really good overview around West Invest and sort of its genesis, where it's headed. Um, I think we all feel we're really fortunate to be working on this project because it is a really, really unusual government grant program in that it is focused on infrastructure, but it is not its primary driver has not been necessarily economic, directly economic generating infrastructure. So it's very much for us a fill in the gaps kind of grant program and a significant size of money really focusing on this concept of livability, on the concept of amenity. And it isn't often in government you get a chance to be able to reach out and find and fund projects which may not necessarily return a VCR of one or greater, uh, and very often some of their benefits cannot be quantified. Um, and so that makes this a really quite unusual uh, grant program. So I'll, I'll run through some of the structure and, and happy to come back to any of those questions. Um, many of you will be familiar with some of the basics. So 5 billion in total, 15 LGAs, Christopher outlined, really focused on enhancing communities and improving livability and amenity. And the projects are really going to be assessed on their potential to drive transformational change and make Western Sydney a better place to live now and into the future. So that's a quick kind of overview. Here are the 15 LGAs, uh, which Chris had mentioned, so I won't go into that in any more detail. Um, the program itself, the whole of the program, is structured very much around these six focus areas. And they are quite deliberately broad. So green and open spaces, community infrastructure, school modernisation, arts and cultural facilities, high street activation and local traffic programs. And this is very much the, the focus areas that did come out from the community conversations and discussions during lockdown and where there was generally a consensus that an investment in these six focus areas will really lead to the sort of long-term growth and development that we want to see in Western Sydney to really make it the best place for everybody to want to live. Um, I can, and I'll come back to more detail a bit later. We've broken the $5 billion into two main programs. There's $3 billion set aside for New South Wales government agencies um, to deliver transformational projects. We're currently assessing uh, what we call internally NPPs or, or new policy proposals. They've come in, they've been assessed by Treasury. Um, my program officer currently assessing them at the moment as well. So that uh, government allocation process is being managed through the normal government budget process. Uh, and so there's significant checks and balances and, and steps and processes in all of that. So that $3 billion will be allocated to government agencies. As Christopher alluded to, we're really focusing on projects that are not normal government BAU where there are other funding options available. Some may argue those funding options are not sufficient and, and they're never sufficient for anybody. <laughs> But this, uh, we are not looking at funding the sorts of things that government would otherwise normally have funded through the budget process. So we are not funding state roads. We are not funding hospitals. You know, we are not funding, um, you know, other major normal infrastructure programs uh, that the government would fund. Uh, we are really targeting this at the sort of infrastructure and pro, uh, uh, projects um, that are going to really support that livability that we talked about. The other two billion is for community project grants. And we have again split this a little bit. We've allocated for just over 400 million, it's 401.8 across the 15 eligible LGAs. So each council's receiving a base funding of 20 million plus a top up based on the per capita, uh, their population. So somewhere between 21 and 35 million across the 15 LGAs. We've very deliberately done that. Every project that is funded um, from a council through this fund still must meet the West Invest guidelines. They still have to lodge a business case. They will still be assessed against the guidelines. They still have to have merit and they must line up under the West Invest. But we're just making sure that every council and therefore every LGA and therefore every community across this part of Sydney has access to a, um, a fundamental foundational amount of funding and particularly given when we're talking about livability, that the sort of social infrastructure that can support that is very often localised, 
and it's very often the responsibility of local government. So local government is a really key player for us in this program. Key partners. So as a foundation, we've allocated this between 20 and 35 million across the councils for complying um, programs, projects of merit. And, and we're working with councils at the moment on the, on the process to have those lodged and assessed. That leaves us with approximately 1.6 billion to go into the community group through this competitive round. And that is also open to councils. They can apply for other competitive projects as well, if they wish, but it's open to otherwise a, a broader range of community organisations. Before I go into the detail of that though, I will just say we have had a program running called Have Your Say. It's just closed on the 31st and we're just assessing the applications now, uh, the uh, information that's come in now. But that's given the community an opportunity to be able to um, have their say about where they would like to see uh, West Invest money uh, being spent and what sorts of projects are they interested in. So we're collating that advice now and that feedback will be fed into our assessment process when we're looking at projects as they come through. Uh, a quick overview of eligibility. So eligible applicants have to be non-government entities, not for profit. They must be a legal entity. So that does include local councils. I know that sounds a bit confusing when we say non-government, but technically in our world, local government, because they're set up under their own legislation, um, are not state and they're not federal government. So they're in this bucket as well. Certainly local Aboriginal land councils, um, other non-government organisations, registered community groups. So it is quite a, that's a, not an exhaustive list there. That's some examples, of the sorts of organisations who will be eligible. They have to be non-government, non not-for-profit, and they must be a legal entity. So it could be sporting groups, the universities, clubs, Christopher alluded to that before, multicultural groups, charities, faith-based groups, incorporated associations. So it's quite a, a wide um, definition for eligible applicants. Uh, and they either must, this is after all an infrastructure program. So eligible applicants must either own the land that they're going to build their project on, or they must have some kind of uh, a written approval uh, from the landowner, evidence that they can fund the operation and ongoing maintenance of, of the infrastructure when it's built. So there is no funding in here for the ongoing program or for the activation of any kind of infrastructure. It is an infrastructure program. So we are expecting a number of you know, partnerships between say community sporting organisations and councils that may well own the playing fields that they want to build infrastructure on, that sort of thing. Eligible projects, so our eligibility tests have these two elements. Is the applicant eligible and is the project eligible? Eligible projects have to deliver infrastructure. They have to fit into one of those six focus areas that I went through. They must be located within one or more of the 15 LGAs. We have a minimum grant of 250,000. Um, they have to make an improvement to livability outcomes. Uh, and there's a lot more um, information in our guidelines around how an organisation could provide evidence to us around how they're going to do that. And they must drive transformational change. And Christopher did talk about the fact that we are very keen to see projects at scale, and we certainly are. But I will say that we are not discounting the impact and the transformational change that can be made at a local level at an LGA level, as well as at that kind of regional scale. And we are very much looking for projects that go across the spectrum in terms of size and complexity. Thanks, Joe. I'll just say a few things here about partnerships because we are expecting to see quite a lot of partnerships, which is great, and we've been encouraging them, and, and Christopher similarly said the same thing. So we certainly will look at partnerships uh, favourably where there's a co-contribution that can strengthen the project. So it may be a contribution from a for-profit entity, but the primary purpose has to be to deliver the community benefit. If there are commercial aspects to a, an infrastructure project that's being proposed, they really need to be incidental. So the sort of example we're thinking of here is, you know, if there is to be, say, an art gallery or some sort of cultural facility that's built, there may well be a coffee shop or there might be some kind of cafe attached to it. There could even be a gift shop attached to it. 
Now, if that incidental commercial aspect, um, one, improves the amenity of the services and the facility that's available to the community, but secondly, it may help um, make it more sustainable financially with ongoing care and maintenance and costs, then we would certainly look at that. But anything where the primary driver is a commercial operation, even though it may result in jobs, it may result in other benefits for the community, you know, we're, we're all for great commercial operations, don't get us wrong, um, but this project is not funding those sorts of projects. So any commercial um, element to a project would have to be incidental and really be linked to its ongoing viability. Uh, the eligible applicant would, if we there was a partnership, say with a for profit, they would not be eligible to apply themselves. So it would have to be an eligible applicant who actually applies, and that would then be the the organisation, uh, the legal entity with whom we would enter the funding deed, who we would expect to deliver the project, and we would expect them to have the ongoing legal management and control of the infrastructure afterwards. Um, but we certainly will look at, you know, I, we can't foresee every possibility about every project and every type of partnership. So we are very open to having a look at uh, joint funding arrangements on a case by case basis if, if people get a business case in and can explain how they expect it to work. Key dates. So the program itself was launched, was first announced back in September last year, formally launched on the 24th of February. Uh, we have opened, we went live on the 31st of March, so our registration of interest process is open. And I really want to emphasise that that is a compulsory step. It's a mandatory step in the process. If an organisation does not register an interest and get themselves into the system, then they cannot lodge a full application when we open up application. vague thought bubble that you might put in an application, please make sure you get a registration of interest into the system. Keep your options open because we will not be able to accept applications from people who've not lodged an initial registration of interest. Um, they'll be open for three weeks uh, and then um, we will be assessing all of those ROIs mainly to ensure people are eligible. So again, we'll be doing an eligibility test on the organisation and an eligibility test on the project. We don't want community organisations who are ineligible or their project is not eligible going through the whole process of a business case and what is you know, a complex application if they're not going to be eligible. And we'd rather let people know up front quite early that, that they're not going to be eligible for this. So hence the ROI. Um, Another key reason for us rolling out this ROI or this two-step process is, of course, that $1.6 billion is a lot of money to be offering in a grant uh, program. We don't know how many applications that's going to translate into, and, and every time I try to put some assumptions around it and calculate a number of possible applications, my eyes water and my head aches and I can't do any more about it. So we, we are really hoping to get a strong sense through the ROI process around how many applications will need to be assessed? Um, you know, are they looking like they're across the 15 uh, LGAs? Are they looking like they're across the, um, the different six focus areas? Have we got a great mix of projects, you know, that are small, large uh, in terms of transformation? Um, but that will really help us uh, be much better prepared for the assessment process so that we can get that undertaken as thoroughly as we can and as quickly as we can. We'd really want to get projects into the community and started as soon as we can. So registrations of interest are open now uh, and they will close on the 21st of April at 5 p.m. Not five minutes past five, they will close at 5 p.m. on the 21st of April. We will then be assessing them and uh, the full application process will be open on the 2nd of May. It then closes on 27th of June. Uh, and we will then start the assessment process as soon as we can. And so we are hoping to start advising applicants from November. Um, we will give more specific dates around all of that when we have a, a sense around the numbers and complexity of assessment that's going to be required. We do imagine there's going to be quite a bit of uh, work with individual successful applicants around finalising their projects, um, you know, having final costings, working out the final project plans so that funding deeds can identify the appropriate milestones. And, you know, so it could be some months before we sign up all the, all the funding deeds. 
But we are quite keen to see projects start as soon as possible. We've said that ideally we'd like projects to be finished within a, a four year period, if that's possible. However, some of these projects are going to be quite large and some of them will be complex. Uh, and so that four years may not be a reasonable time frame, and we will look at negotiating the time frame of projects on a case by case basis. Uh, so in order to assist our applicants and try to support as much as we can, uh, we've got a lot of information available on our website. Um, the guidelines, the frequently asked questions are all available now on the website. We're running a series of webinars. Um, and so there'll be some webinars run particularly around the ROI process on next Monday. And then we're also running some webinars after the applications open, which will be more targeted at the business case and what do I need to fill in and what kind of evidence do I need? So the details around those are also available on our website, but again, we'd ask for your assistance through your networks to get any potential applicants aware of this uh, and get them to you know, come and join us and hear more about West Invest. So. I talked about the have your say right at the beginning. This is a bit of an overview for you, a very high level overview of what we've heard from the community. So about 5,300 surveys were completed by community members. Um, and generally speaking, you can see sort of in the in the colours there, uh, parks uh, and urban spaces came in at about 22%. Local traffic programs was the largest with 31%. But I must say we did have one or two very well organised campaigns and I'm sure many of you will will know how they work. Um, so there's a couple of key issues in there and unfortunately one of them particularly is not eligible for funding under West Invest. So we're looking at other options around that. Uh, the next one that came in was enhancing community infrastructure, uh, modernising the schools as, as came in at 11 per cent. Um, Arts and cultural facilities at about 8% and revitalising high streets came in at about 11%. So, um, and members of the public were able to actually give us some details about projects that they'd like to see funded. So we're working through a more detailed report with some of those ideas and we will feed those back through local government um, and into indeed the state government um, with some of those ideas uh, to when we, when we can have more detailed look at what the community have been asking us for. And that will help us to inform priorities as we look at funding. That's it for the slides. So um, I'm really more interested in answering specific questions that people may well have. Um, and so we, we do have a few, Alison, as well. So um, I think Sarah Nielsen from Stockland was, was first um, asking how important it is to check in with local council to see if they support the initiative within your LGA prior to submission. Uh, for the council component of the funding. So well, certainly if councils are a partner, uh, yes, we would need to know that all partners are, are, are on board with a project and um, that, you know, that you've got any consents or approvals that you might need. So um, I think uh, if I, let me just see if I can bring up the chat and I can have a look. Um, if um, we are expecting quite a lot of applications for projects on council owned land, as I said. So uh, the proponent will need to have the council permission to go ahead and do that. Some councils are actually going to be reaching out to you know anybody and, and all of their networks and saying, you know, please come to us first. Please talk to us about uh, you know what it is that you want to do on our land firstly. Uh, so uh, we but we certainly won't be giving any final approval to a project if a council objects to, to it. But it's clearly no point uh, in doing that. So anyone who wants to, to build something on land they don't own absolutely must have the landowner's approval quite clearly. Adam, can I just supplement that to Alison? Would you, you don't require pre-planning approval for a project. If, you, if you own your own land and you made a submission of your NGO or whatever, do you require some sort of council sign off that that's what you want to do would generally be within planning codes? Well, we have put some wording in the guidelines and I'll refer you to that. So uh, we will accept proposals uh, and, and applications that outline what the what the pathway for getting planning approvals are. And depending on the nature of the project, there could be any number of consents or approvals that people need to have. And you do not have to have them all in place up front. 
Um, but as long as you can outline for us what you expect those approvals and consents are, and you flagged for us the clear pathway that you expect to need to take to achieve those, we, we imagine we're going to have quite a number of projects that we may give provisional approval to, subject to achieving the, the sorts of consents and approvals that are needed. Um, and we may either, and this will depend on the project, we may either enter into an interim funding deed or we may indeed say we've got provisional approval and we'll enter the funding deed with you when you've got everything in order. Questions, yeah. Sarah. Um, Jackie Vozzo had a couple um, of specific questions relating to the ROI process. Alison, I don't know if you can see that in the chat, but essentially um, asking, does the registration of interest need to be elig an el eligible applicant or can you just register an interest and then subsequently find um, a partner for the application? I think no. that was question number one. No, we will need to know who the applicant's going to be. We can't assess if they're eligible or not if we don't know who they are and you're not able to answer the questions. So when you go to do the ROI, it's a bit of a self-check. So it, it, it will ask you to enter certain key fields, such as your, your ABN or your ACN or, you know, your status as an organisation. And if you can't uh, get through those first questions, you won't be able to register an, an ROI. So, um, so we do need to know who the applicant for the project is going to be. And that may well tell you that, okay, we're not eligible, we can't apply, we have to find a partner to, to work with. And then that partner will have to come in and, and lodge it themselves. I see there's also a question there about do you want to register each project or can you just uh, enter one? Generally, you will need to have a separate ROI for each project that you want to um, you want to seek funding for. You know, if it's a separate funding proposal for project A over here and project B over here, we need separate ROIs because we do want to look at the eligibility of both the applicant and the project. We have had a council uh, has asked us, could they put in a program of works, if you like? They want to do upgrades to, say, sporting change rooms across six playing fields. Now, given that the projects are all the same, they're all going to have the same kind of livability outcomes. They're, you know, it would just, uh, a set six separate business cases would just be a repetition. All you do is change the location. Then we would look at that as one program. But generally speaking, we would need each project to come in as a separate ROI. Jackie, I noticed you had your hand up. Did you have something to elaborate on? Yeah, I did. So, um, Alison, I just wanted to go back to my first question in relation to it must be an eligible applicant. Um, mm -hmm. It is only a short period of time within which um, those registrations of interest close. I think you had on there it was closed by the 21st of April. Correct. Um, there potentially are a number of different partnerships that uh, in particular Penrith Lakes could partner with for this, but I'm not sure that that necessarily would get sorted by the 21st of April, uh, which was why sort of my question was around, well, can we put it in? Because it certainly will be something which one of them will decide to go with, but who it is by the 21st of April may not be known. Well, look, I have no discretion around the 21st of April. It's a firm date. So uh, I guess my only suggestion to you would be put in two options. Um, you know, we may not we may not end up with with two business cases, obviously, to do the same project. Yeah. But well, at least we could assess whether either of your options provide you with an eligible partner or not. OK, thank you. Um, I see Christopher's had another question around Catholic education um, and whether other independents would be eligible for some of the school improvement grants, Alison. Yes, they will be. OK. Well, um, just before I get to Louise, I see Daniel's got his hand up as well. One of the question I had, Alison, was relating to that $3 billion um, state agency allocation um, and whether there was any opportunity within that sort of allotment to um, have you know, other partners um, sort of tap into that same work with state government for a specific project. Is that on the table or is this solely within the remit of, of you know, the government agencies? Uh, look, the uh, we wouldn't rule out funding um, from the three. So you're suggesting what do we find out of the $3 billion state government bucket? Yeah, and whether that bucket would apply to any organisation that had a, you know, a, a proposal that tied into one of those state agencies. Mm. We certainly wouldn't rule that out. That's that's a possibility. 
Um, but that money is being allocated through the budget process. Mm. So, you know, government agencies were originally asked in November to start to put proposals in. Um, we've been trying to working with as many agencies, you know, who have reached out and who we've reached out to. That That's closed. We're now in mm. the process of assessing those. Yeah. So uh, I think the opportunity now to create new partnerships that may be funded from that state government um, bucket, I think, has mm. passed. Uh. Okay. Unless, for some reason, and we, we have no idea around what this is going to look like yet, but unless for some reason we were undersubscribed um, mm. and we went to a second round, then, uh, but I, I don't know whether that's likely to happen mm. or unlikely to happen. So, well, Yeah, well, maybe you'll have a bit more visibility once the RRI process is finalised and you've got a clearer set of, of what's coming and, and what's not. Uh, thanks. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, Louisa Ford um, had a question around um, how do you see infrastructure that gives back to the community but is not necessarily accessed by the community working within this program? So the example she used there is medical research, for instance. Yeah. Look, I think that's going to be very hard for this program. So primarily, you know, the first question for us is really, does it fit into one of the six categories, the priority focus areas. And I think things like um, research facilities, medical research facilities, uh, you know, I don't know that you would describe them as community infrastructure. Um, and they don't really fit into one of the other six priority areas. So my advice would be, depending on the nature of it, to ha have a look at the guidelines. Um, and, you know, if you felt there was something about your project that meant that it would sit within one of those six priority areas, those focus areas, then by all means, put in and put in an application. I absolutely get and, and support 100% that medical research, you know, and other projects will provide huge benefits to the community. Whether it's necessarily in this livability and amenity space that's really focused around how people can use and move around and find the sorts of, um, you know, livability type support for their local community, uh, I'm not sure that that's the, 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 you know, if this program is the one to fund that. Thanks, Alison. Daniel, uh, Bankstown Airport, all yours, mate. Thanks, Adam, and thanks again, Alison, for a great presentation and further information from the guidelines. My question is sort of along the lines of Jackie's in terms of just the time frame um, to get, you know, in front of, say, uh, a local council to have their support um, to participate alongside them on, say, council-owned land. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a general comment, I guess, and um, mm -hmm. the good news is, is that they've already got through the pipe their own registrations of interest. So you're not sort of competing against, you know, that process. Um, so that might that might assist. Um, can you give us a window? I know there's a webinar into the registration of interest, but mm. in terms of that tight time frame, can you give us a window into, you know, what a registration of interest, you know, needs to needs to have in it? Is it copious? Is it just a signaling, you know, of the scale? Um, so you've got councils nod, you've got their permission to to have them as the eligible applicant. Um, you know, are you looking for, you know, a window, not necessarily, you know, um, the full proposition, because we're going to have to bake that with. No, it's a two pager. Uh, I might, I might just hand over to Mark, my colleague Mark K, um, yeah. and so Mark can probably give a little bit more detail about what's in the ROI. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alison. Um, look, the ROI is pretty straightforward. It really is only testing whether the um, applicant is eligible uh, and whether the project is eligible against um, the six focus areas and whether the applicant considers that it is a transformational project for a section of the community. So when it comes to getting um, things like landowner consent, um, planning approvals or um, documenting what those approvals are, that's not what really what we're interested in at the moment. Um, really just um, um, who the applicant is, um, does it meet um, the applicant eligibility in the guidelines, is the project within the six focus areas and is it transformational? And we're really just doing a yes, no assessment on um, those questions um, and um, um, those further details will be dealt with in the application phase. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, I think Christopher's been busy in the chat. Um, yes. He's got, got a couple of questions here. First one, um, is government expected to use some of the Western Vets Fund to, to buy land off private owners to develop some of those amenity projects? Uh, well, we are certainly, land purchase is certainly an eligible cost under the funds for either community communities, councils uh, or state government. 
So depending on the project, purchase of land um, may well be uh, required. And so, yes, uh, we, we are expecting that in some projects that will be a key element. And indeed, we had a conversation with council, one of the councils yesterday around their concern that they just don't know what the market value of land that they want to buy is going to be. Uh, and so our advice to them has been uh, that, you know, uh, given the timing, that they should put in a business case based on their best and, you know, reasonable estimation of what they think the project's likely to cost, given the understanding that until they actually go to the market, they may not be sure. Uh, and, um, you know, so when we come to assess the business case, if they've outlined the assumptions that they've made for their costings, then when we go to assess whether this, you know, looks like a reasonable business case or not, we can take that into account. But but we do accept that, you know, you're not going to have been able to go out and, and purchase land and you can only make the best estimates. We've had similar questions around the fact that given latent market conditions at the moment around civil construction and, and other areas that costs are an issue, time delays are an issue. Um, and so some proponents will, will not have had time yet to, to even go and get formal uh, quotes for work. And so again, we're suggesting that your project should go in with your very best estimate you can give us of reasonable costs. Um, but as long as it's quite clear in your business case that this is based on a, you know, a, a, a well-judged uh, assumption around the costs, uh, and then uh, we would then be able to uh, test that um, if the project passes everything else, then we would expect a proponent to go and get hard fixed costs and we can then negotiate the final budgets, you know, after after a provisional approval. I think um, you may have already answered this one in, in um, previous question, but um, CB asks whether um, NGOs or private applicants could partner with um, WAPCO or Parklands Trust, TAHI, some of the other agencies, um, if they choose not to go down the council path um, as part of that RIO process. Is that is that an option? Yeah, certainly those sorts of partnerships are, are, are possible. We, we have to, the, the applicant that applies must be eligible. But they could certainly partner with for-profit organisations. I, I think that's really the premise of the question. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think school infrastructure will be the other. Obviously, school infrastructure is going to get a fair chunk of this money for this. You know, we've called for the digital access, the providing to address that di the digital divide issue. So I think there are another significant government agency that has um, a, a, a mm. big role to play here. Yeah. Uh, Luke um, asked the question around um, public housing estates and, and how their eligibility may apply. Um, um, is it the case that um, would the project need to be proposed by LAC for government agency funding or would it be in the pool of a community-led projects? Where does the public housing sector fit into this? Well, it, it depends really on what the, what the infrastructure is. So generally speaking, we're not expecting West Invest to fund social housing. Um, similarly, we're not funding, you know, state roads and hospitals and other key elements of, of uh, infrastructure. But we wouldn't, I'm not at this stage, not ruling out, say, a project where um, either a community housing provider um, through the community stream that we're really talking about today may want to seek funding to build some kind of community infrastructure on or associated with a housing estate um, or an area where there's a high proportion of, of social housing in the area. So something like that may well be uh, maybe a possible project. But again, the applicant would need to be an eligible applicant. Um, and But if the project is focused on that livability and that livability support, but community infrastructure is definitely one of our key focus areas. Uh, and so if a community has a high level of need around um, needing more community infrastructure, and that may be uh, because there's a high level of social housing, that could be a whole raft of other reasons, uh, that community infrastructure could be eligible, providing the applicant is an eligible organisation as well. I think we've got about five or ten minutes left before we start wrapping things up. So if anyone does have any further questions or comments, please feel free to make them either in the, the chat section or put your hand up. Um, one of the things that we have heard through the dialogue, especially, especially through our, our sort of finance partners, um, have, have asked whether there is scope for banks um, like NAB and other institutions to, to back projects or support them and something that Christopher has um, been quite vocal on. Um, is there an opportunity for, for these institutions to, to work with DPC to maybe supplement the fund? Um, gosh, I haven't been asked that before and I'd have to take that on notice. 
I don't know about supplementing the fund. I'm thinking here around the technicalities of where the funding's coming from. That would be something we would have to talk to Treasury about whether that's possible or not. Um, it would certainly be possible for those organisations, for the bank or a financial institution to partner with a community organisation and provide funding directly, you know, as a, as a co-contribution to a project. Um, in terms of supplementing the fund itself, um, I don't. I would have to take that on notice. I I, I couldn't give you an answer around that um, at the moment. Be great, Alison. Um, yeah, look, if you can get back to us, yeah, when you when you get an opportunity, um, I'm sure our, our, our financing and banking partners would love to sort of know um, whether there is an opportunity to fit within well, or, or support. Take it from five billion to six billion. You know, I yeah. mean, no problem. You know, <laughs> the extra coin. <laughs> Love it. Um, James from Canterbury Bankstown Council has um, put a question in around what funding stream would a project that is part funded by council and state government um, fit in? Uh, it's most likely to fit into this community organisation, I would think. Um, again, we'd have to look at what the infrastructure is. Core questions for us would be who's the applicant? Uh, if it's the council, then we would it will come out of this community round. And who will own and look after the infrastructure going forward? Uh, you know, if it's the state government that's going to own the infrastructure and be responsible for it going forward, then we would suggest that the agency themselves should be the applicant and therefore it will have had to have gone into our budget process already. Um, I think that's all of the questions that have come through. Does anyone else have any other comments? Um, obviously, that the 21st is a, is a pretty important date, Alison. Um, so I mean, strongly encourage everyone who's got an interest um, to sort of get get moving, they've got you know just over two weeks. Um, obviously, we've got Easter in between that, so um, the clock's ticking on that. But um, is there any other message that you'd like to impart before we we start wrapping things up, Alison? Can, can I supplement that question down for Alison as to what you're running this program? What do you expect? You know, discussions we had about how do you pick these projects that will have the long term transformation, and we've all seen the pre election projects of a roundabout here or a, or, a, or a change room there. From a DPC perspective, deep policy perspective, how do you think Western City looks differently in, in 10 years' time as a result of this fairly significant uh, injection to try and inspire these guys in the sort of projects mm -hmm. you're going to look favourably upon? Look, um, what I would love to see in five years' time, in 10 years' time, is certainly the green and open space. And I think that's probably been the element of this program that's really inspired people the most both at a government level, can I say, and, and at, you know, local level as well. And, and there's a real element of that. So when we've said we want things transformational, we have put some criteria in the guidelines that say how we will assess those. One of those criteria that we will take into account when we're looking at transformational is that it's going to um, pick up on a program or an opportunity that's unique and is there now. And if we don't take that opportunity now, we will lose it. And given where Western Sydney is in its level of development, green and open space is right on the tipping point for us. If we do not capture that green space now and quarantine it to keep it for parkland and open usage, and often that can be joint usage, you know, I mean, quite separate to West Invest, Sydney Waters just announced a really great project around how we're going to completely rethink the way we use and manage, you know, water and wastewater in the in the environment. And so those sorts of projects, but the, the land and the green and open space is an opportunity we have now in the next 10 years. And if we don't capture it and we lose that land, we will never get it back. So for me, that's certainly one of the things that, that I am I think is really quite inspirational. The other thing I think for me that we really learned out of lockdown, no matter where you were in Australia probably, but is that the way people like to use their very local space um, when you, you know, you can't leave your LGA, when you want to walk, you know, when you need to do things. I think our concept around that has changed quite significantly. And I think for councils that has a real focus on what, this high street activation and local street programs and local traffic activation. So there's a really strong reason why those two focus areas are in here. And I think there's an opportunity for us now to rethink the way our town centres and our villages, our local centres work, so that cars are, are moved to the periphery and that it's more people focused. Active transport is far, far more on people's minds than it ever was. Um, and, you know, you don't even have to be able to ride a bike now. You can just get on a scooter and do all sorts of things. Um, 
So I think there's a real opportunity for us to rethink the way many of our town centres work. Most of them have got a really busy road that runs right through the middle of it, cuts it in half and doesn't make it a very pleasant place or a safe place to walk around. So really seeing um, local centres transform that way by rerouting traffic, rethinking about how we move from a car to a bus to a train, how we can use active transport through those centres. I think there's enormous opportunity there for your local place, your place, to be to be really special. Uh, we'd love to see a lot more of that. Yeah, I think I want just building on, on, on Christopher's point there around the assessment, um, and apologise if this is already sort of made public through the portal, but is there a, a panel or is there any detail yet on how and who's involved in that assessment of those projects, yeah. Alison? Absolutely. So the assessment process um, is we will use assessment panels. So there'll be an initial stage of assessment, which is about, again, eligibility. We'll do another check to make sure that everything that comes in with a full business case um, you know, is eligible. Uh, and then we will then uh, look at, so we've really got three steps. First is, are you eligible? Then the second step is uh, we will then look at the merit assessment of a project. Um, so that's the project assessment and we'll use assessment panels. Um, they'll be made up of uh, government representatives from across different departments, subject matter experts to come in, but we will also use external experts to come in and look at panels and we'll set those panels up. So, you know, the people looking at the parks have got the right expertise and the people looking at the traffic have got the right expertise. Uh, and so that's why the ROI process is really important for us because we really need to start to think about how many of those panels do we need and who should we be calling on to come in and, and assist us with those. So that's going to be really important as well. Um, once we've done that merit assessment of projects, um, there will then be a third stage and it's what we're calling the project alignment or program alignment. So we will step back and look at all the projects we think have merit and say to them, how are we going to fund this program so we achieve the outcomes for the West Invest, um, the, the, the big scale outcomes that we're looking for? And we want to make sure then that we're funding a mixture of projects that cut across um, council areas. So are all communities seeing some benefits? Are we getting projects across all of our six priority areas? Are we getting projects across the spectrum of um, transformation? Are we getting projects that will transform local scale things, programs that will transform the LGA scale, and also regional scale projects? And we do want a mix of projects across all of those things. And then we also want to see the picture about how do they all fit together? And obviously it will depend on the total amount of money we've got available. So, so that program alignment is almost a last step back to say, as a whole picture, do the bits of the jigsaw all fit together here with these projects that we've said have merit? And I will flag that it does mean there's a possibility that we may have individual projects that score quite highly when we score them, but we may decide not to fund them because they don't fit into that big picture. You know, we may get I don't know, I'm just guessing, you know, 65 projects to all do one very similar kind of thing clustered in one area of the region. And we may not decide to fund them all. It doesn't mean that that particular project had a problem. It's just that in terms of how we achieve the West Invest program as a whole, we do need to look at the sum of all the pieces as well as the individual projects. So that program alignment is not always a step that's in um, funding grant programs because often grant programs are much more targeted at a very specific outcome, whereas ours is actually exceedingly broad. Um, so, so we've quite clearly outlined that in the program guidelines around that process and how that will happen. Ultimately, um, our steering committee, which is made up of three of our senior public servants, uh, will make recommendations to the treasurer and the treasurer has the delegated authority under the act to make the final decision about what's funding. If the treasurer were to decide to um, uh, change or not not accept the advice of the steering committee, then that will be documented, um, and and we will will understand why that that is the case. And um, so yeah, so there are there's balances, there's checks and balances, and some quite strict governance and and approval processes built into the system. Right. As Christopher said, we're under a lot of scrutiny. We're very well aware of it. Everyone's watching. We're not. We're the least of the ones watching, but everyone's watching. Um, but can I wrap up by first thanking Alison, also Mark and Joanna. Um, I know DPC's under the hammer to get this done. They've been in a very tight time frame. 
it's great to have five million dollars to play with, but you've got five minutes to do it in. And um, so it's I know how hard they've been working and they appreciate the spirit in which they've been engaging us and others in, in trying to make it as good as possible. I also want to thank our partners for get, getting online and all the other people we've spoken to in recent weeks. Stuart Ayres issued a challenge last night at our dinner about what do we do as a community once the first responders leave? Not only because it's still pissing down outside, but uh, and more broadly, uh, we've, we've been the beneficiaries in Western Sydney of, in recent times, an awful lot of money and attention and leadership from government to shape out the city for us. We can't, we have to find a way to help government wean itself off that, and we have to step up as a group, private sector, the NGO sector, the third sector, academia, um, as the privatisation money dries up and the election cycles move away and eventually government reduces its load, we've got to take the bat and run with it. This is a great project. It's a great resetting project. It's not the last of the big government money, but it's a it's a baton there that we can we can make five billion into six or seven billion by people at small or high level um, involving themselves. It's a great way to form a stronger local government, state government relationship, and it's a great way to get things like registered clubs, and NGOs, and others, and the private sector money in to really shape out the physical nature of our community. So it's a challenge to all of us. I hope we all live up to it. Alison, thanks for laying out the criteria in which this will be assessed. We don't want people wasting their time if it's if it's not going to fly. We'd rather than put them to productive effort elsewhere. But we want to spark the imagination of a sector that can take this challenge, use this money, and genuinely form transformation, long-term transformation in the lives of, of the communities of Western Sydney economically and socially. So lofty aims. Let's see if we can do it. We've uh, the, the, the clock's ticking. So thanks, everybody, for your time. Thanks, Adam, for, for running it. Thanks for the opportunity. Yell out if you need a hand. Cheers. Bye.